That's cool. Thank you for getting the mic to work for the black dude as well. I appreciate that very much. It's working fine for everybody else. Yo, Pastor, that's so cool, man. Because I just saw him actually in Vegas. That's funny. <laughs> he says he's in Mississippi. That's awesome. So we're going to have some fun. My name is Michael Jr. I'm going to do some jokes. We're going to laugh. It's going to be cool. I love how they... Up there, it's all dark. They got all the black people at the very top up there. It looked like a curtain, but I know those are black people. I know they're here. Looks like a curtain. <laughs> That's some fun. The joke's not going to start immediately. I just want to point, point that out. Wow, I look a little pudgy in that picture right there. I want to point that. Hey, during the announcements, like during the worship, it was awesome, but some of the backdrops, like can you put up some of those backdrops you had during worship? You had a couple backdrops. You want to? Or not, if you don't want to, that's cool too. Yeah, that right there, uh, black people don't like water. We can't do that one just no more because I felt like I was drowning the whole time. I was scared. I felt like I, <gasps> so it was a little overwhelming. Yeah, that's okay. Um, is that a man, is that a stalker in the corner? I saw a dude kind of looking like I'm about to get him any second. It was scaring me, I'm just, for, I haven't started the, the comedy yet, just so you know. Okay, that's enough for the back. Yeah, back to the pudgy Michael Jr. That's cool. So we're gonna have some fun. It's amazing that I get to do comedy all over the place. I do. I perform in Vegas at the casinos. I perform in, at all the clubs, like Zanies and all those clubs. And I perform at churches too, which is amazing because when I was a kid, laughing at church was illegal. <laughs> I couldn't laugh at church. I told some of y'all before, but I'm gonna tell y'all my story. I'm gonna get you. You guys get filled in on the whole story. Last time I did like 10 minutes or whatever because pastor wanted to come up here and talk or whatever. <laughs> whatever, dude. Um, when I was seven years old, my grandmother used to force me to go to church. Anybody here been forced to be, go to church before? Anybody was forced tonight? Who was forced tonight? <laughs> That's awesome. The dude raised his hand. I was, I was in the middle of playing a video game and I got snatched up. They used to force me to go to church and I would go to this church and I didn't understand what was going on. I go in this church and this dude is up on stage and he mad at everybody. I didn't know what was going on. I figured out he was mad because he had some phlegm caught in his throat. Because at the end of every sentence, he would try to get it out. He'd be like, the Lord said, ah. act like you ah. I'm like, grandma, he need to gargle, grandma. I'm seven years old, nobody's teaching. Stuff was scary, man. I didn't understand what was going on. One time I went to church, there was a dead body in the front. Nobody explained to a seven-year-old Michael Jr., it's a funeral, it's not church. I'm thinking, yo, that's how they roll. Like every three weeks or so, they bring a dead body in as an example. Dude on stage yell at us like we did it. I remember asking my grandma, I was like, Grandma, what happened to the man in the box? What happened to the man in the box? Her whole explanation was, he in a better place. I'm like, what kind of box did he live in before? <laughs> that stuff was miserable, man. Nobody was teaching. I love a pastor who teaches so people can grow. This dude wasn't teaching. He was yelling. He had a Bible in his hand. He played like he was going to throw it at people. And everybody would get scared. They'd be like, hey, man, hey, man. I realize now they were saying, hey, man. I didn't know. <laughs> I was seven years old, man. I didn't know what football was. I was 23 years old, man, because it came on Sundays, and we was at church for six hours straight. <laughs> and we'd go in the basement, eat a sandwich, and come back up. I'm like, what was that, halftime or something? <laughs> Stuff was miserable. Then I turned 14 and my grandmother did something different. Instead of forcing me to go to church, she asked me if I wanted to go. I was like, let me think about this. Um, no. I ain't going to church. Stuff was whack. We went to church and right around 15 years old, me and a friend made a pact that we wouldn't curse anymore. I don't know nothing about Jesus, but me and him made a pact that we wouldn't curse anymore. If he heard me curse, he could hit me in the chest hard as he wanted to and then vice versa. Yo, I stopped cursing immediately. Dude could hit it hard. So we decided we're not gonna curse. And we still did regular things like any other kid. We played that game, Slug Bug. Remember Slug Bug? The game, you see a Volkswagen, you get to hit your friend for no apparent reason. 
But in my neighborhood, it was a little rough, so they would add to the game. We also played Uppercut Fire Truck. You ever play that one? <laughs> Minivan Body Slam, what about that one? You ever play that one? Our games was a little rougher. I remember as a kid, growing up in the neighborhood, I remember as a kid, we used to sing songs like, Oh, McDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. My dad would change the lyrics to better suit our situation. He was like, ain't no farms around here. So he changed the song. The song went, the McDonald family lived in the hood. E-I-E-I-O. Would a fool shut your mouth. You don't know me. You're the backup. I will bust a cap. Yo mama here. E-I-E-I-O. Stuff was a little different, man. So. We decided we're not going to curse anymore. So we just decided we're not going to do anymore. So we tried to expand our vocabulary. Then right around the f junior high, I started noticing, well, before this, but then I started really picking up on the fact that um, I had a hard time reading as a, as a child. I just really did. I had a hard time reading. Um, like I read fine now, like those signs over the door that say excite. Like I can read that. Take your time, man. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> oh, before I go on, I want to say I'm excited that I can stand here and tell you guys uh, it's been like it's been like two years since I've had a cigarette. I'm excited about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, um, it's been a little longer. Uh, I've never had a cigarette before, so uh, huh, interesting how you guys can applaud for two years, but uh, nothing for a lifetime, huh? huh. No. No, it's too late, Christians. It's too late. Maybe I should get a habit you can get behind. Huh, yeah. <laughs> That's one of my favorite jokes, man. That's why I just threw it in there. So we decide we're not going to curse anymore, and I'm in school, and I'm noticing that I'm having a hard time reading. Like, my reading, even in, in, in grade school, was really, really subpar. Like, it was really subpar. And uh, what I would do, like in junior high, because I didn't want people to know I was having a hard time reading, I would look at a word, and my brain would scramble to figure out what the word was. I would look at the word like seven different ways. I couldn't sound it out, I couldn't figure it out the normal way. So I would look at a word seven different ways to determine what the word was. I would look at the font size, the color, the positioning, what's in front of it, what's behind it, how people are responding to it. I came up with at least seven different ways to look at one word to figure out what it was so I could, so I could move on. And I got really fast at this to the point where people didn't even know I was struggling reading. I was just figuring out, my brain was like moving. Come high school, nobody knows that I'm having a problem reading, but yet I have this ability not to just get words seven different ways, I would also look at people and situations seven different ways almost instantly. Now I look back at it and I think, I used to think that this was a handicap, like something was wrong with me, like God made a mistake, but the truth is, that was the devil trying to make me think that something was wrong with me because all along God was using that to prepare me for what I do now because that's the primary place where I pull my comedy from. You may look at a situation one way, I get to see seven different possibilities almost immediately. There's an example. There's a, uh, when I was reading the Bible some, a while back, uh, I noticed in the Bible that Jesus had a little brother. His name was James. When I read that, first thing I was thinking was, man, how much pressure was that? Right, Jesus, your big brother, that's a lot of pressure. So these random thoughts will come to my mind constantly, just random thoughts whenever I see something because I'm looking at them seven different ways almost immediately. So what I've decided to do is I'm going to share with you some of Michael Jr.'s random thoughts. And um, I'm also going to share with you another talent that I have um, to play the keyboard at some point soon they're gonna be bringing it out one of these days cool awesome yeah thanks man yeah, appreciate it cool i was glad there's some white people who are late it's awesome <laughs> you guys are awesome yeah we didn't really work this out at all in practice did we you just put it right in front of me that's cool you know what, let's set it over here at a little angle because this, this part didn't go good. The next part won't. <laughs> let's just set it right here. Cool, thanks. You're a big dude, man. What's your name? What's your name? Chris. Chris, wow. He's a big dude, man. What's your name? David. David, cool. Wow, you're bigger than I thought. 
No, nah, because in the Bible, you were a small kid, but. What is he doing with that thing? Are you like MacGyver or somebody? What's going on right now? That is awesome. Yeah, this is a, this is cool. Well, hey, David, where are you from? As long as we're sitting here doing nothing, where are you from? Right here. Wow, your bed is here somewhere too? That is awesome. <laughs> David, cool. cool. All right, yeah, you have no idea what's going on right now, do you, David? <laughs> that is so cool. You don't even work here, do you, David? You just had on black clothes. It was like, hey, we need you backstage. <laughs> awesome. Cool. So what we're going to do is I'm going to use that microphone if it works. I'm a little scared to set this one down. Let's see what happens. If so, we know what side of the tracks David is from if it doesn't work. <laughs> I just made that up in my head right now. There's seven different ways. It wasn't that funny. Let's see. Hello. So these are Michael Jr.'s random thoughts. These are just random thoughts. Now listen, the thing about my random thoughts is they're just random. These are thoughts that I just have and I want to share them with you because they're just random thoughts. Now listen, if you hear a thought, go ahead and laugh if you like it. But if you don't understand a thought, just move on because you'll miss the next thought. So here we go, Michael Jr.'s random thoughts. I'm gonna start playing now. Just random thoughts, okay? Just random. Why are stay-at-home moms always gone? Take your time, man. It's okay. It's okay. If a woman gets pregnant in Vegas, does the baby have to stay there? Is it considered natural childbirth if a baby comes out with an afro? Some of y'all don't know what an afro is, do you? I've noticed that no one seems to care about the outer city youth. It's okay, just move on, just move on. Is the word tofu short for tried to fool you? When it comes to sharks, what's so great about the white ones? Should Dave Ramsey's website take credit cards? Where does non-local anesthesia come from? I've noticed that no one seems to care about the outer city youth. He's a god of second chances. Do vegetarians really love animals as much as I do? If God didn't want us to eat animals, why'd he make them out of meat? Can I call a white duck a quacker? Why are there no mirrors in the self-checkout? Go ahead, help your neighbor. It's okay. It's okay. Why is abbreviation such a long word? You know, they say 85% of people admit that they're not good at math. I'm sure there's people in the audience right now saying, wow, I'm glad I'm part of the other 22%. Some people have GPS machines just so they can hear someone say they've arrived. 
Did old McDonald go bankrupt? Why is the song in the past tense? Are you singing it in your head right now? When someone from Mexico comes to America, do their friends tell them, whatever you do, be sure to drink the water? And finally, if God clapped his hands, wouldn't that make a big bang? It's just a theory. Thank you very much. I'm Michael Jr. Those are my random thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Yo, this is what you gotta catch. I don't even come up with those random thoughts. I can't think that way had not it been for what looked like a handicap when I was a kid. And now millions upon millions of people get to laugh because of what I thought was a, I was dealt a wrong hand, but I wasn't. God was just preparing me. God will allow you to go through some things, but all it's gonna do is make you stronger. Because if you don't gain that strength, you won't be able to pick up the trophy that he has for you at the end of this thing. So press on toward the mark to win the prize at a high calling. And even now, God is still doing some amazing stuff with this talent, it's kinda, it's kinda weird. So now let me fast forward, please keep track. I was seven, I was 14, 26 years old. I moved to New York City. I'm like, yo, it's time for me to get my comedy career going, because in New York, if they don't like your comedy, the way to let you know is they'll say something like, we don't like your comedy. <laughs> so there's this club in New York called the Comic Strip Live. It's a really hard club to get into, like really hard. Um, in fact, uh, they have an open mic on Tuesday nights. They used to have an open mic every Tuesday night, and, co and it would start at 7 p.m. Comedians who are new in town would start lining up at 6 a.m. just to do, have a chance to get their name drawn out of a hat so they can do three minutes in front of the manager. So it's my turn to finally perform, and I'm about to get on stage, and this comedian named George Wallace walks in. And I love George Wallace, but here's the issue. Whoever when George, somebody like George Wallace walks in, whoever's next automatically gets bumped and they have to wait. I'm next. And the manager walks up to me. And this is where God shows up for the first time in my life. Well, this is where I noticed him. <laughs> the manager walks over to me. He's like, Michael, listen, George Wallace is here. Do you want to go on before him or after him? I was like, let me go on before him. So I go on before George Wallace and I have New Yorkers laughing. Then George Wallace walks in, he's laughing too. I'm like, oh, snap. I finish up my set, I watch him, and afterwards, there's a bunch of comedians around him, they're all talking to him. He leaves them and comes over to me, and he says, you know, you're really funny. I was like, yo, thanks, man. He said, let me ask you a question. Why don't you curse? I was like, I don't know, what if my grandmother walk in or something? <laughs> what else was I gonna say? I'm a grown man now. I'm supposed to say my friend might hit me in the chest. So he laughed, he said, you know what, you're funny and you're clean. I'd like you to do a show with me and my best friend in a couple nights. I was all excited, I was like, yes, this is awesome. I didn't even know who his best friend was, it didn't matter. I get to the show, it's me, him, Jerry Seinfeld. For real, we do two shows, I get two standing ovations, I rip. I'm the man, I'm like, yeah. After the show, my manager walks up to me and he says, Michael, listen, um, we're, uh, we're going to church tomorrow, man. You want to go to church with me? I was like, church? You better back up. I ain't going to no church. Please, am I sick or something? I ain't going to church. Because I used to always see church on TV, and somebody was like, I almost died. Then I found Jesus. I was like, well, you was going to meet the other dude if you didn't. Click, 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 click. I ain't going to church. Church was like for drug people or something. People was like, I was on drugs. and I found Listen, I'm not saying this to brag. I'm just telling you the truth. I've never done drugs, I've never smoked. I stopped cursing when I was 15 years old. I'm not, I'm not trying to hear any of this Jesus stuff. That's for people who really need Jesus. I'm cool. Then his fiance asked me if I wanted to go, and she was fine. <laughs> I didn't even know pretty people went to church, man. When I was seven years old, they wasn't pretty, I'm just saying. <laughs> and she had some kind of accent or something too. She was like, Michael Jr., would you like to go to church with us? I was like, absolutely. I was just thinking about going to church the other day, man. 
yeah, I want to go to church. Shoot, I've been waiting on somebody to ask me to go. So I go to this church. I can't even find them. I just go to this church. There's 5,000 people at this church. And this dude is up on stage talking about Jesus. He ain't screaming. He ain't yelling. He don't got no perm. Dude just talking about Jesus. Then he did this thing. He did an altar call. He said, well, before that, he said, he said to the whole audience, there's 5,000 people there. He said, can I get a hallelujah? And I know that means he wants us to say hallelujah. So 4,999 people said hallelujah. And I said to myself, I'm not saying that. I don't know what it means. Then he said, in case there's someone in here that doesn't know what hallelujah means. I was like, this place is creepy. <laughs> he was like, it's the highest praise you can give to God. I was like, man. And then he did an altar call, right? He said, if you want Jesus in your life, you got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and come on down. Jesus is yours. And I was like, eh, I ain't going down there. I got to read the pamphlet first. I don't know what this is about. So I told myself I'd read the whole Bible before I went to the altar. I didn't even have a Bible. I didn't know it was that big. <laughs> then this lady at O'Hara Airport a couple days later, who I don't even know, goes like this and hands me her Bible. I don't even know this lady. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and start reading this. But I opened up the Bible. I read the very front, the front cover. I read the inside of it. It's the Bible was made in Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> me too. So I started reading the Bible, I'm digging into it, I'm reading, I'm going to church, I'm reading, I'm putting in like, now nah, at this point, I'm reading and I'm learning and I'm going to church and I want to go up to the altar, but I told myself I'd read the Bible first. Now you don't have to read the Bible before you come to the altar, but I just wanted to and I was reading a lot, I was putting in like 14 hours a day reading the Bible, that's like seven pages a day. Like I was digging into that stuff, I was like. <laughs> I don't know why y'all laughing right now. Anyway, so I'm digging into the Word, and I'm going to church, I'm digging in. It actually took me like two and a half months to finish the Bible. I finish the Bible, I go up to the altar at the beginning of the church. I'm like, yo, can we do this right now, or I got to wait to the end? What's the deal, man? I know Jesus is here. You said it, right? So I go up to the altar, and I give my life over to Jesus, and I realize now, like, I don't understand the whole Bible by any degree. I just don't. Nobody does, but I understand now that this funny that I've always had that God has been uh, grooming without me even knowing it, I'm, I'm not just funny, like I'm funny for a reason. Like there's reason for me having the sense of humor that I have. And even though I didn't know God at that time, God was still working out his plan for the greater good for those who love him. I have celebrities all the time tell me to, or they ask me to explain God to them. I'm like, I can't explain God. If I could explain God, he wouldn't be God. But this is what I tell them. I say the best I can, first of all, this ain't even close. But God is like a, he's like a navigation device in your car. You ever been in a car with a navigation device? You ever been in a car? You ever been in a car before? What about that? A horse? Been on a horse before? So God's like a navigation device in your car. If you punch in the coordinates as to where you want to go, and it says go 10 blocks and turn left, but then you go 10 blocks and turn right, it doesn't abandon what you're supposed to do. It recalculates what you need to do to get to where you're supposed to be based upon where you are. The only problem is if we keep making the wrong turns, the road conditions will be different. They may be a little rougher and you'll run out of time. So you have to be sensitive to listen to that voice to make the right choice about where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do. And the only way to really hear that voice is to invite it inside as opposed to outside. When the voice is outside, you don't even know it's God. We give them different names. What are some of God's names? Faith, okay, cool, that's a good one. I know a girl named Faith, but all right, that works too. Yahweh, what else you say? Jehovah, exactly. Here's another name that God has. Nobody knew it, but then God shared it with me, I get to share it with the rest of the world. The Sadducees wanna leave right now. <laughs> anyway, oh. Another name that God has is something, S-O-M-E-T-H-I-N-G, something. We always get a choice in life, right? We could choose A, which is the right thing to do, or we could choose B, which looks like fun. Sometimes you choose B, then you gotta deal with the consequences from choosing B. And one of the first things that come out your mouth while you're dealing with the consequences is, man, something told me not to do this.
that something is clearly God. And I know there's some people in this room, something told you to be here tonight. And this is going to be phenomenal. Yo, before I move on, I always forget to do this because I'm so non-commercial. I got some really cool stuff you guys could buy afterwards. I got a CD. It's actually called Michael Jr. Funny for a Reason. Because <laughs> it's funny for a reason. It's like 17 tracks of funny, but the last track is a three-minute salvation prompting message. So get one for yourself and then get some for your coworkers and be like, hey, listen to this. <laughs> Welcome to the kingdom. My brand new comedy special is out. It's called Michael Jr. Laughing on Purpose. It's not even in stores yet. It won't be in stores until August. You can get it here today. And then I'm going to tell you about this shortly. It's a documentary I did. And I wrote a children's book too, which is awesome because when I was a kid, I couldn't read one, but now I wrote one. That is awesome. So don't worry. We spell checked it. So go ahead and get that. Uh, I'm excited about that children's book. Oh, and what we're doing with, since there's so much stuff going on in the world, uh, what we've decided to do with the proceeds um, uh, is going to my kids. So, you want to, yeah, so. So I leave New York and now I move to Los Angeles. I got to find a church in Los Angeles because you can't just go to anybody at church. You got to, I got to find a church in Los Angeles. I found a nice one. And then there's a club in Los Angeles that's really, really hard to get into. And I want to get into this club. George Wallace happened to be in town, so he takes me into the Comedy and Magic Club. I walk into the Comedy and Magic Club, and in the green room, this is the, this is the level of club this is. In the green room is Gary Shanley, George Wallace now, and Jay Leno. I walk in, suddenly I'm in the presence of these soldiers in comedy, and I'm brand new in town. And at the time, they were working on a joke. Anybody remember a football player got hit in the eye with a flag? Anybody remember that? He got hit in the eye with a flag and he was suing the league for like $400 million. Now Jay Leno, Gary Shanley, and George Wallace are all working on a joke for Jay Leno's monologue for The Tonight Show. I ain't saying nothing, I'm just happy to be in the room. But your gift will make room for you. So I'm sitting there, got, I'm sitting there, they're working on a joke, then it got quiet and they looked at me and I was like, oh snap. This is an opportunity. So I was like, all right, let me see if I got this right. Um, he got hit in the eye with a flag. He lost his vision in one eye, and he's suing the league for $400 million. Um, he's not gonna see half of it. <laughs> for real? Listen, please track with me. I can't get there that fast had I not been practicing for so many years before that. There's people in this room, you've been practicing through some handicaps. Like if one of your legs is messed up and don't work, you're gonna be the best scooter rider on this side. I mean, I'm just saying. The church where I got saved at, this wasn't even part of the schedule. The church where I got saved at in, in New York, there was five trees planted. This is bonus, because I wasn't planning this at all. There was five trees planted. And um, A.R. Bernard, like years later, one of the trees was smaller than the other trees. So he asked the gardener, he's like, why is this, they were all planted at the same time, why is this one smaller? The gardeners go and get two four by fours and they start beating on the bottom of this tree. Cuck up, black, black, loud. Cuck up, black, loud. They start beating on the tree and he's like, yo, what, well, yo, what? He didn't say, yo, that's me telling you the story. <laughs> he's like, why are you beating on the tree? And they explain, they say, when you beat on the base of the tree like this, it sends it into a trauma and its natural response is to grow. So listen. You've been through some hurts and some pains, but because of that, you're going to grow. The question is, what direction are you gonna grow in? Are you gonna grow bitter, angry, selfish, or are you gonna grow up towards God? You have to make a choice because the wind will come and your roots can be exposed. That was bonus, I'm just gonna move on. I don't even know where all that just came from. It was just extra. So now I'm in the club. I'm in the Comedy Magic Club on a regular basis, headlining there on a regular basis. Roughly three years ago, I'm doing a comedy show, I'm doing a show there, and God changed my mindset about comedy. When a comedian gets on stage, he wants to get what? He wants to get laughs. I was completely about getting laughs. God changed my mindset. What is a mindset? A mindset is a fixed mental attitude that predetermines a person's response or interpretation to a situation. God changed my mindset, Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He changed my mindset 
to instead of getting laughs from people, I am to give people an opportunity to laugh. It changed the whole game. I go up on stage, I do my show, we have a great time. I leave, there's people outside, like always when I'm at this club, they want autographs, they're telling me their favorite jokes, they want hugs and high fives. It's the same situation every time I leave this club. But this time, on this night, while I'm talking to the people, I look across the street and I saw a homeless guy. I had never seen a homeless guy outside this club before, ever. But that doesn't mean he wasn't there before. That just means before my mindset was to get laughs from people. So why would I even notice a homeless guy? I noticed him and I was like, what about him? How could I give him an opportunity to laugh? Then I asked God and God was like, you really want to know? And I was like, nope. Because <laughs> you know it's going to be an assignment or something. <laughs> then I said yes and we went and did this comedy tour like no tour before. We made a film of it. It's called Comedy the Road Let's Travel. Um, we went to four locations. First place we went to was Fort Worth, Texas. There's a place there called the Samaritan House. Everyone there is homeless and they have HIV. And we, we brought them all together in a room and we did a comedy show for them. And they laughed. Like, I didn't know what was going to happen. And they actually laughed and had a great time. At the end, this guy talks to me and he says to me, I just want you to know, up until tonight I hadn't laughed in over 20 years. When he said that, I almost started crying. I was like, man, I ain't going to be crying. You better back up. We leave there, we go to Montrose, Colorado. There's a place there called the Dolphin House. The Dolphin House takes care of children who are being abused by their parents who are on drugs. This grandmother tells me the story of her grandson who's so afraid of his mom, everywhere he goes, he wears a Spider-Man costume. One of the things she's been doing to him is she's been pulling out his toenails. She explains this story to me of this little boy. Then I hear all these other kids' stories. Then they bring them all in, and I got to do jokes for them. If my mindset was still to get laughs from people, there's no way I would have been able to do the show. But God changed my mindset to giving people an opportunity to laugh, so I had to do the show. It's part of my assignment. So I go up on stage, I start doing comedy, sitting right up front is Spider-Man, full costume. I start doing comedy 20, maybe 25 minutes into it, I hear a voice while everybody's laughing, I hear a voice and a voice says, my name is Ronan. This little boy pulls off his mask and introduces himself to me. And he starts talking to me for like nine minutes like I'm not doing a comedy show. <laughs> he talked about Spider-Man, he talked about Batman. He said, Batman has a belt. And I was like, well, I got a belt too if you don't sit down somewhere, right? <laughs> it's exactly what happened. The whole room laughed. It was like one of the biggest laughs of the night. And listen, I can guarantee you, Cornerstone, it was not in my notes to do a joke about whooping kids <laughs> in a room full of abused kids. <laughs> but God knew what comedy needed to be done. The gorilla, so to speak, had to leave the room. We had an amazing time. We left there, we went to Skid Row. Dude was like, I've been homeless for seven years. I was on crack cocaine for five years. I was beaten, I was stabbed, and I was left for dead. I could really use a laugh, Michael Jr. Thanks for the pressure, dude. <laughs> Same guy has to use his left hand to keep himself from falling out of his chair in laughter. It's so cool because in this film, you get to see the transformation that takes place. We leave there, we go to a, a youth prison. It was a little hard. They want you to banter with them. You know, go good with that muscle shirt, some muscles. <laughs> what is that, a wife threatener? That's what I would say to him. Anyway. Take your time, it's okay, take your time. <laughs> so then we leave there and we go to an adult prison. Now listen, all of the stuff I just explained to you is in the film, you can get all of that stuff afterwards, but this part isn't, but I gotta tell you what happens. We go to this adult prison in the state of Washington. I'm scared for real, I don't mind telling you now, I'm scared for real. As Soon as I walk in, the warden takes my belt from me. He's like, you can't have a belt. Somebody might try to hang you. Can't they just boo me or something? Why they gotta hang me? I'm in prison, my pants loose. This is a bad idea, man. This is a bad idea. I'm just, I'm just saying, I got seven different ways to look at this, man. 
So I'm scared for real. You walk into prison and the bars open in front of you, then they close behind you. They open again, they close behind you. They open. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I don't gotta explain. Like, Pastor probably already explained it to you a couple times. <laughs> so I'm scared. I can't even run. I'm walking in. I need a joke immediately. I got seven. I'm, no jokes are coming up. I need to be funny. They need to like me immediately, but not too much, you know? I'm walking in and I'm scared and the bars are opening and they're closing behind me. They open in front of me, they close behind me. I'm scared. I'm walking in. I got no joke. I don't know what I'm going to say. I got nothing. I had one joke pop up, but I didn't feel like I should start with it. I was going to be like, you know, you guys are a captive audience. <laughs> I just want to say that. You know? But I wasn't going to start with that. So I got nothing. Literally, I got nothing. I walk in. There's no stage. There's no glass. We're not doing comedy on the phone. Yo, these cats are right here, and they all got on pink jumpsuits. So what? I ain't saying nothing about them jumpsuits. <laughs> like, I'm scared, and I have no joke. I don't know what I'm going to say. I remember walking in, and I put this, this right foot down. This is my last step. Three feet from me, all prisoners. This is my last step right here. This foot comes down as my last step. I remember lifting this foot up. I have nothing. I don't know what I'm going to say. I put this foot down, still have nothing. I settle this foot. And for real, sitting right up front is a white dude with a white beard named Moses. I was like, thanks, Lord. I looked at Moses, and when I said these words, the place exploded in laughter. We had an amazing time. I said, Moses, this is what I want you to do. When you see the prison warden, I want you to look him in his eye. I want you to look him right in his eye, and I want you to say, let my people go. For real. Please catch this. I, sh I don't think I should have to say it again. But I don't get to that moment. I don't get that line. Had not I been practicing, even when I didn't know I was practicing. My mind thinks really, 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 really fast. At first it was out of survival, but now it's out of what God wants me to do. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you the trailer to Comedy Roll. Let's travel. We're going to drop the lights. I'm going to show you the trailer. It's almost two minutes long maybe not and then uh, I'm gonna say a couple words and after that then we're gonna bounce bounce means to vacate the premises <laughs> check it comedy the role let's travel you've seen him on the tonight show with Jay Leno a talented young comedian very funny man Michael jr. so much go on people still need to laugh it's just important that it's funny first and foremost regardless of whatever else happens they look real hard I mean like that they've really been through some stuff. Some of these kids are away from their families. They haven't seen them. Their families don't want to have anything to do with them. I mean, it's probably been a long time since they've really been able to laugh. I have to bring the same show that I would bring if I'm playing a theater. I was 13 when I did it. This is the lowest point of my life. But to me, I'm ready to move up already. I'm tired of it already. And I've only been in jail for two years. If I could see It's good to hear you guys all laugh together as opposed to laughing at each other. 29, I'm homeless, I'm an addict, and I need to laugh. <laughs> uh, my dad bought a house and he put all five of us in it, and he never was home. Some person I heard me sigh. You know what I mean? to do a comedy show for drug endangered children. In Montrose? So That's not funny. Oh. I was at the drug endangered children's meeting at the Dolphin House. I didn't see too much fun in drug endangered children, but uh, I changed my mind. I came to Samaritan House in 06. They gave me no chance. To start my life over again. <laughs> I just said, you know what, let's take comedy on the road, let's travel, let's see what the people's reaction will be. For him to come in and make us laugh like how he did, 
come, come talk to us, you know, that, that make us feel like more human. He laughed so hard the building was leaning. <laughs> it was just a joy to laugh. Reaching a lot of guys, I tell you, reach me. Actually showed me that I, I can be sober and have fun. All right, so check it. Um, we're still doing events like that where we go to, because this is what God said to me. Like, people always quote me and they'll say stuff like, the, um, you know, laughter is good like a medicine, and that's in the Bible. Well, God said to me, um, well, why don't you take it to the sick? And I was like, okay. Oh, you, you start playing? All right, that's okay, cool. No, it's okay. <laughs> it just it was, it got a little emotional when you start playing. That's why I mentioned it. Just, it's cool, you can start in a minute. But I wasn't expecting it, you know what I'm saying? That's cool. I mean, it was nice, but I didn't want to be crying and stuff, you know what I'm saying? So, cool. So this is the thing. This is what comedy, this, God allows me to come into churches and do stuff to people. Like, whoever talks to the person on the piano, you never say nothing. You just act like it's part of it. But she just started playing. I was like, yo, because God is different than you think. Like, we're about to laugh, and some lives are about to be changed, too. I'm just going to tell you flat out. For real. So I'm gonna tell you this really cool story, and then uh, and then we're gonna bounce. Bounce means to vacate the premises. <laughs> anyway, so check it. I was doing a, I was writing a joke. I was up at like five o'clock in the morning writing a joke because I got five kids, um, and you gotta find time. I got five kids. There's a lot of kids, man, and I travel a lot, so I can see them. You know, so um, that's not that's not true comedy you can play in a minute in a minute i'm just you you'll know it when i finish this story which is a true story then you can play okay i don't even know how you got up there he's like hey i want some camera time too i just want some camera time i want people to know i got skills that's what i want people to know no i'm just playing i asked her to be up there i asked her to be up there so for i was writing this joke um about the good room anybody know what the good room is you didn't know it was called the good room i named it the good room but now I'm explaining to you what it is. You're gonna be like, ha ha, I know what the good room is. I was writing a joke about the good room. The good room is that room in the house, maybe your house, most likely your grandmother's house or your aunt's house. It's the good room. This room looks better than any other room in the house. And can't nobody go in there. <laughs> the room looks amazing, but you cannot go in that room. So I was up and I was writing a joke about the good room and God stopped me, arrested me and said, I want you to tell this story to my people. I'm like, okay, I'm going to tell the story. So this is, this is what it's like having a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what this story is about. Imagine that everyone in this room, everyone everywhere, but for right now, everyone in this room, imagine that you're a house. You're a house. And outside of the house is Jesus Christ. And he wants to come in. But he'll never force his way in. He wants you to open a door and invite them in. Now there's people in this room, and I know, because during worship, God was all on my neck about this. I was actually praying in my hotel for people in this room by name, I've never met you before, but I'm positive you're about to make a decision. So everyone in here is a house, and, the only, and God wants to come in, Jesus wants to come in, but he wants you to open a door and invite them in. And the reason there's people in this room right now who won't invite Jesus into the house is because you're cool with the way things are right now. Whenever you need something, you walk over to the door, you open it up, you say what you need, you make your request, then you close the door and go back into the house. But that's not a relationship at all. And the reason you won't open the door is because your house is a mess. And you think you have to clean it up first. But it doesn't seem to be coming clean. You've probably even invited other people into the house in hopes that they could help you clean it up or at least distract you from the mess. You may have brought drugs into the house hoping that somehow it would miraculously become clean, but it's not working. The only person who can clean it up is standing outside the house wearing an apron with a bucket in his hand, 
waiting on you to open the door. And then there's other people in this room right now. Wow. Probably a volunteer, probably more than one volunteer, maybe even a staff member or two who used to have Jesus in the entire house. But for some reason or another, you've tried to evict him. You've moved him to one room of the house, the good room. Have you ever noticed how the good room most of the time is the room right up front with the big window? So when people walk by, they look, they see that room, they're like, wow, that house is clean. But the rest of the house is a mess. Wow, that person really has a relationship with God. No. It just looks like they have a real relationship with God. The rest of the house is a mess. And I gotta warn you, I gotta tell you, when you invite Jesus into the entire house, for some of you, for a lot of you, he will show up with a contractor named the Holy Spirit and remodel the entire house. And today is the day you get to make the choice to invite him into the entire house. Okay, you're not gonna play now, you're just gonna. So this is what I'm gonna do. This is so cool. We're laughing in the midst of this and a grip of people are about to make a decision right now. When I say a grip, that means a lot. I know there's a lot of slang I'm throwing at you. So this is what I wanna do. Everybody in the room, I want you to just close your eyes, bow your head. I used to, when I used to go to church as a kid or, or even as an adult, people used to say, close your eyes and bow your head. I was like, that's creepy. They're gonna pull some money out of my pocket or something? What's gonna happen? No, the reason, this makes sense. The reason I'm asking everyone in the room to bow your head and close your eyes is because I don't want anyone looking around. Because you're gonna make, people are gonna make a decision right now and I don't want you to be intimidated by who's looking. So what I'm gonna do is, this, if this is you, if I spoke to you and you know you need to invite Jesus into the house or into your entire house, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to do something really simple. I'm just gonna ask you without looking around, just to shoot your hand right up in the air. Just hold your hand up so I can see it on the count of three. Hands are already coming up. This is awesome. I'd like to count to three though, if I could, just because that's how I like to roll, but y'all don't want to wait. That's fine. I see hands going up. On the count of three, just put your hand in the air saying, yes, God, come into my house. One, two, three. Just put them right up. Praise God. I see you. I got you. I got you. I see 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 you. Bruh, I got you. I see you, I see you, I see you, I got you, I got you, I got you, I got you. Wow, if your hand is up, go ahead and make eye contact with me so you can know that I acknowledge you. God sees your hands regardless. He sees your hand, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you, the cute little girl in the pink. You are a beautiful, cute smile. You're awesome. I see you right here. Keep your hand up, nice and high so I can see your hand. Nice and high, I see you. Yeah, you wanted to play video games tonight. Now nah, look, I see you, I got you, I got you, I got you. Praise God. I see you. Who's over here? Yes, yes, yes. The girl with the pretty name. I see you. Okay, this is what we're going to do. In case I missed your hand, it doesn't matter. Bang, I see you in the back. That's cool. It looks like you got two hands up because you're sitting too close to the, to the lady. I see what's going on there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I see you, bro. I see the sister in front of you, too. This is what I'm going to do. This is very, 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 very important. Go ahead and put your hands down. This is very important right now because Jesus actually says this. He says, if you will take a stand for me before men, I will stand before my father in heaven for you. This is huge. Jesus is going to take a stand for you and he wants you to take a stand for him. How do you do that? By making a public declaration of the decision that you've made. And I am giving you a, at standing here as the person in the pulpit I'm giving any volunteer and any staff member permission to stop whatever you're doing and make this choice. I don't care if you're on camera, I don't care if you're doing editing, I don't care if you're on the, what, you just stop and you make this choice and you come up top. So on the count of three, what this is gonna look like is everyone who raised their hand or should have raised their hand or wish they would have raised their hand. On the count of three, I'm gonna want you to stand to your feet and make your way forward. Some of you guys are feeling a little scared right now don't do it because fear comes from the devil and he doesn't want you to succeed. God wants you to succeed. So when I count to three, don't even 
think about it. Stand to your feet. Make your way down here. I want to meet you. I want to greet you. I want to shake your hand. We're going to pray. And we're off to the races. They're already coming. This is awesome. One, two, three. Come on down. Give them a round of applause. Applaud, applaud, applaud. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, this is so awesome. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Yeah, yeah. Ah, ah. Praise God. I pray for you guys by name. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I absolutely did. I absolutely did. Praise God, man. It's a nice shirt, man. You can hunt in that shirt. It's awesome. I see you, bro. I see you. Yes, yes. Yeah, come on, it's okay, keep clapping, y'all can clap, you ain't doing nothing. Praise God, you guys can face me because we're going to pray. Yes, I see you, you're all pretty and stuff. I see where she gets it from, y'all related? Because you both look, wow, God is amazing. What's up, bro, how you doing? How you doing, My sister, cool. I didn't mean to take the black people here first, man, my bad. God, praise God, praise God, praise God. See, how amazing is that, listen. We're cracking jokes in the middle of some life-changing decisions. God is different than you think. He's not mad at you. He ain't tripping. He is excited. These people in this room just applauded, but it cannot compare to the applause that the angels in heaven are doing because of this decision you have made right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see you, pretty lady. That is so awesome. High five. High five. Cool, it's gonna be a low five. You ain't quite tall enough yet. Okay, cool, cool. Praise God, praise God. So listen, um, so it's not too late. Like if you wanna come on down here, it's really, it ain't too late. It's Saturday, we had church. We ain't going nowhere else. <laughs> that was a great laugh. It sounded like somebody was stabbing you actually. <laughs> so we're gonna pray, but this is what's not gonna happen. We're gonna pray and you're not gonna grow some wings. Like you're not going to be an angel after this. What you have to do is you need to get plugged into a, a good church. A church that's not just good, but they like to have fun and do stuff like how comedians come in. <laughs> Remember I was telling you about the tree. Have you ever seen a small tree before? It's small, they just planted it. Then it has those little bars on the side of it with the wire attached to it. Those bars are like Christians, strong Christians. Because what they do is they stabilize the tree because the wind will come. But you need some strong Christians next to you to make sure you can resist the wind. Also, what's going to happen is some of you guys are going to lose the taste for some of your friends you currently have. And that's good. Because God's going to bring some better friends along. Some of y'all already know who they are. <laughs> some of y'all already know who them friends are. You're like, man, he owed me some money too. This <laughs> is... Just let it go. Just, just let it go. Because what God has for you is so much more valuable. All right, so this is what I'm going to do. We, we're going to pray, and then I think they're going to, y'all take them somewhere? Is that what's going to happen? Yeah, they're going to take you to this room. It's not going to be creepy. It's going to be, it's going to be, trust me, it won't be creepy. They're going to get you, they got a gift for y'all too. They got some gifts and stuff. So let's pray. Just repeat after me, bold and confident and assured of what we're talking about right now. Dear God, thank you for forgiving me for my sins. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die for me. Come into my house, Lord. Come into my heart and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't go anywhere. Give him a round of applause. Yeah, that's good. Yo, y'all getting a standing ovation. Y'all ain't do nothing but walk up front. That's all y'all did was walk. You ever get a standing ovation for walking before? That is awesome. So look, this is what's going to happen. They're going to pray. The cute little girl from the back. They, we, we just prayed. Now the outside, you're the same. You got the same clothes on, but the inside is different. The inside is different. You've allowed something, the Holy Spirit, to come in. And he gonna, he'll speak to you. But you got to dig into his word. Believe me, reading is not my thing by any degree still. But when you dig into his word, things change. It'll come to your remembrance. You'll know some stuff. You'll know what to do. Instead of saying, something told me not to do this, you'll be like, yo, I'm not doing that. 
So I'm not going to talk too much. Um, somebody's about to come up and tell y'all what to do. Don't go anywhere. It's not going to get creepy. We're not going to be giving y'all some Kool-Aid and pudding or whatever. Be whatever. And now we're going to escort everybody. Follow that guy in the white shirt. And, and listen, if you're with them, they're on their way. Don't worry. It's not going to be creepy. They're going to come back. Well, you know, you go to church here. Anyway, here they come right now. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. I'm going to take some high fives on the way by. Bling, 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 Awesome. Praise God, man. Praise God, bro. Yeah. Oh, snap. Hey, we do all look alike. That is awesome, man. Cool, bro. Check you out, man. Oh, pretty lady. Hello. It'd be inappropriate for me to say that to you. Check you out, bro. Cool. Yo, um, that was so awesome. I don't know what happened with the time, if I'm good or what. Anyway, so this is what I need you guys to do. I'm a, I need you really to, because uh, I don't have a church. I'm not a pastor. But I do want people to come out and see and laugh. I'll need a lot of people to come to my shows. So what I need for you guys to do, as simple as it sounds, I just need you to go to Twitter, Facebook, tell people what you saw, and then follow me and like me because more people will come out. And then they'll go to that room where it better not be creepy. <laughs> so really, really, I really need you guys to do that. Go to my Facebook, go to my Twitter, like it, tell a bunch of people about it. Just say, hey, he was funny, or whatever you want to say, and people will be like, really? And then they'll come to a show, catch him with the comedy, keep him with the truth. And go out and buy a bunch of stuff, because I want your money too. So um, <laughs> I appreciate you, I love you. Thank you so much, I'm Michael Jr. Thank you, thank you, thank you.